Welcome to the Haymaker MMA Show with your hosts, Tanai Shah and Ian Wall. UFC 255 this Saturday, pay-per-view. We've got 12 fights to break down. we got early prelims, prelims, and then, of course, the main card. Starting at welterweight, we have Lewis Kosi, minus 400, taking on Sasha Palanti. Palatnikov, sorry, plus 300. <laughs> um, Kosi has a record of 7-0, and and this is going to be his first fight in the UFC. His last fight was in August on Dana White's Contender Series, where he got an early first-round knockout. Um, in his seven wins, he's had seven finishes, five knockouts, TKOs, and two submissions. Um, Sasha, on the other hand, has a record of 5-2. and two. This is also going to be his first fight in the UFC. Um, he had a TKO win in September, and two knockouts TKOs in his career. Ian, give us something. So, looking at uh, Kosi, or whatever, coming off the De- uh, Dana White Contender Series wins, he's got all of his wins are first round, whether it's a KO or or, um, or submission. Uh, looking like he's got a great trajectory coming off the springboard of the Dana White Contender Series. Shasha, or Sasha Palatinuk of, Palatinuk of whatever, however you want to say it. Um, just less experience coming out of, um, you know, more the he's fought in the UAE Warriors, lost to Manir Lazez, who also had a sick sick win in the UFC recently. So there's no shame in that, but just kind of less uh, less notable competition. And um, Kosi already kind of broke the seal with his uh, Dana White Contender Series, just a little easier to make the transition into the the UFC after that. And after all of his first round one dominations, I think you can only go with uh, Kosi by TKO or submission. Yeah, I like Cozy. Double chance, TK or submission as well. We're getting the line at minus 185 on FanDuel. Yeah, Cozy broken in through the Dana White series, Dana White's contender series. And we haven't really seen too much of Sasha on the other hand, so I like Cozy's chances. Up next, we have Kyle Dawkins at a minus 300, taking on Dustin Stoltfus, plus 235. This is a middleweight fight. We've got Kyle Dawkins with a record of 9-1, 0-1 in the UFC, a submission loss to Brendan Allen, who's very good. And Kyle Dawkins has eight submission finishes in his career. Um, Dustin Stolfis, on the other hand, has a record of 13-1. This is going to be his first outing in the UFC. He did get a nice Dana White Contender Series win in August with a knockout TKO. And he has two, kick, two TKOs. KOs plus five submissions under his belt. What are we thinking for that, Ian? Man, I'm loving Dawkins, the Philly boy, coming in hot. Uh, you know, like you said, he's only got a loss to Brandon Allen, who was in uh, when he fought him, he stuck to the game plan with a really relentless uh, wrestling and grappling game. Um, and I think just looks like the stronger, kind of more mature version of Dawkins. I think Dawkins is more uh, creative on the ground with some better uh, submissions. You know, he's got eight submissions out of his nine wins. And Stoltzus, on the other hand, you know, coming out of the Dana White Contender Series, I was not impressed with the showing on the Dana White Contender Series. Uh, Dana you know, was. Yeah, I don't know how he got. The, he ended up getting the contract. I thought he lost pretty much every exchange in the fight until he took the guy down and the guy's uh, elbow came out of the socket and uh, he won the fight by that. But I thought he was losing pretty much every exchange before that, but somehow still got the uh, the uh, contract. And then even his look doing some fight research just two fights ago before the Dana White Contender Series, uh, you know, this the competition he was fighting in those other regional promotions did not seem he didn't seem like UFC caliber watching a couple fights go and his uh, opponents didn't seem like UFC caliber fighting. So with that being said, I like uh, Kyle Dawkins by points or submission with the Fanduel double chance, um, getting it done over Stoltzfus. All right, I got. Kyle Dawkins as well, but I'll be a little bolder and just go straight submission. We're getting that at plus 170. Like Ian said, Dawkins is very creative on the ground, and even though Stolfis has had his fair share of submissions, I think Dawkins has the clear advantage, and that's where the fight's going to end up with Dawkins' hand being raised. Up next, we have another welterweight fight between Alan Jobin, who opens up at minus 150 against Jared Gooden who's a plus-122 underdog. Uh, Jobin comes in with a record of 16-7, and seven, but he's very well experienced in the UFC with 7-5. and five. He lost a close split decision in April of 2019, so he hasn't fought in a little bit, and he has 11 knockouts, TKOs under his belt. 
Uh, Gunnar, on the other hand, is 17-4. and four. This is going to be his first fight in the UFC. Tough going up against someone like Jobin, for sure. Uh, knockout TKO win in July, but outside the UFC. And then seven knockouts TKO, six submissions for J- Jared Gooden. Yeah, so I, I take a look at Alan Joban here, and his his layoff has been due to an ACL surgery he suffered in his last uh, his last fight against Dwight Grant. Um, you know, he's getting up there in years. He's 39 years old. Uh, he's primarily a striker. Uh, he lost his last fight to a split decision, like you said, but he's still game. He's still, even though he's a little getting a little older, still game to uh, stand and bang. And, um, you know, sometimes that willingness to fight uh, can be the first sign that uh, he's got one foot out the door, but I don't necessarily think Joe Ban's there yet. Um, like I said, he's coming off the ACL surgery, so I think we're going to see him be a little more tentative and um, kind of have a, a big feeling out process in the first round or two, uh, especially good, and it's going to be his UFC uh, debut. Things are going to be a little hungrier, but still you're going to be a little, uh, I think, hesitant to uh, exchange to begin with. He's not necessarily a, a put-your-lights-out um, everybody putting everybody's lights out guy uh, he's got a purple belt so he's not decent on the ground as well this is one that I, I personally think I'm gonna stay would stay away from and from a betting perspective but I think a, a better a better bet to make on this fight is gonna be that it'll go the distance and I'm getting that at, at minus 116 so I'm gonna stay away from the money line picks but I'm gonna I like that it's gonna go the distance all right yeah I think Joe Ban is coming off well I mean he's coming off that injury and everything but I think he'll come out hot he will take cautious first but I think he will look to at 39 will get that win I like Alan Joban at minus 150 Jared Gooden always I mean it's his first UFC fight and it's going to be tough to step in there with someone like Joban who has so much experience we have another welterweight fight in the early prelims Daniel Rodriguez minus 325 taking on Nicholas Dalby at plus 250. Uh, Rodriguez has a record of 13-1, and 3-0 and in the UFC, and all three wins coming in 2020. One knockout, one decision, and one submission. He has a total of seven knockouts, TKOs, and four submissions under his belt. Um, Nicholas Dalby, on the other hand, has a record of 18-4-1. He's 1-1 one one in the UFC, and he suffered a submission loss in July. Um, six knockouts, TKOs, plus four submissions for Dalby. Ian, who we got for this one? So I'm looking at Daniel Rodriguez. You know, he's tough as shit. Hard, uh, hard of stone, hands of granite. Those, those Mexican fighters always coming forward, aren't, aren't scared of anything. Um, you know, he's fought a lot of bigger, stronger guys before, or seemingly bigger, stronger guys before. He doesn't doesn't look like he's in the best shape or like he's the strongest man himself in Daniel Rodriguez, but uh, he still somehow has that natural, that natural gift of power. Um, Dalby, on the other hand, I think he he moves a little a little more. Uh, sometimes that's deceptive. You use more energy there, and as long as you're being efficient, striker. Sometimes the extra movement doesn't doesn't necessarily help you in the long run. But Dalby's a big, strong guy. Um, he's a more primarily striking than grappling, but he doesn't have the worst grappling. He's coming off a, a KO, a pretty or a, not a KO, but he got dropped pretty bad in the first or in his last fight against um, I forget what his name is Ross something. Uh, also, I think that was his debut. A Canadian fella uh, looked real small and dropped him hard and uh, took his back and, and choked him out. So I think Dalby might be looking to grapple more, but even even so, I think Dan Rodriguez is going to be a little too much for him. So I think that minus 300-something line is too much for, uh, for Rodriguez. I think it's closer than that line shows. So if you're going to shoot a shot on this one, I think uh, you have – D-Rod by points or TKO in a parlay somewhere. I'm not confident enough to have him just straight as a, as really any bet in Daniel Rodriguez, but I think he could play a part in some parlays winning by points or TKO. Yeah, I like that parlay pick for Daniel Rodriguez. I'll t- I'd take him at minus 325 just to make sure the money line just goes through and gets one of the legs for your parlay right. But yeah, Rodriguez, I think he's a better all-round fighter. Dobby might be try to like keep it on the ground but like you said Rodriguez has that sneaky strength you know he might not look cut from he might not look super cut but he has that kind of surprising strength that people are really like shocked when they like face him and yeah I think Rodriguez will get it done I'll take him money line minus 325 and a parlay moving on to the prelims we have a flyweight fight 
For the women, we have Antonina Shevchenko, the number 15 ranked, and a minus 168 favorite taking on Ariane Lipsky at plus 136. Shevchenko has a record of 8-2, and 2-2 two, two and two in the UFC. She had a unanimous decision, one-sided loss in May to Catlin Chukagian, and two knockouts, TKOs, plus a submission for Antonina Shevchenko. Uh, Lipsky, on the other hand, has a record of 13-5. and five. She's 2-2 two and two in the UFC as well. She had a submission win in July. Six knockouts, TKOs, plus three submissions for Lipsky. Who we got, Ian? So just breaking it down a little more, you know, Lipsky's uh, mainly a Muay Thai base. Isn't isn't the worst on the ground, but uh, that's not that's not her her area of expertise. Um, and Antonina Shevchenko being a previous Muay Thai world champion, I'd say she's definitely a lot better Muay Thai striker than than Lipsky is. Uh, you look at Lipsky's two losses in Calderwood and Molly McCann, and then you look at Shevchenko's losses in, in Modafferi and Chikagian, and I think uh, Modafferi has a good chance of, uh, you know, as as the kids say, wrestle fucking anyone to a win in uh, in the women's division there. And uh, Chikagian's also, I think it's like the second best point fighter in, in women's MMA, um, second behind the older, or the younger Shevchenko in Valentina. Uh, but Due to Shevchenko's, you know, prowess in uh, in Muay Thai, and I think being the the better striking credentials and being the better uh, striking, you know, when you go back and watch the film, uh, she has decent takedown defense and surprisingly good uh, submissions. You can see in her fight in Lucy Putalova, who uh, was trying to grapple with her and had some trouble uh, when she finally did get her on the ground with with Shevchenko's submissions. So I think being the better striker and having comparable uh, grappling. And better takedown defense and stuff. I'm looking at Shevchenko at minus 168. I think that's great value for her. Um, I think a nice little uh, Shevchenko girl parlay for the for the night could suit a lot of people well. But I'm taking Shevchenko money line and tossing a couple parlays later. Um, I like Antonina as well. She she's taller. She's better at striking and. The only thing I'm a little scared of is Lipsky's groundwork. She had a nice knee bar in her last fight. But Antonina Shevchenko, money line at minus 168. I would take the fight to go to the distance, but the odds are way too high. Not going to fit for anything. But Ian covered all the points on Shevchenko, and I think she's going to get it done. Up next at middleweight, we have Joaquin Buckley at minus 265. Coming off that KO of the year, taking on Jordan Wright at plus 210. Buckley has a record of 11 and 3. He's 1 and 1 in the UFC. He had a knockout win in October, but then a knockout loss in August. Um, eight knockouts, TKOs for Joaquin Buckley. Jordan Wright, on the other hand, has a record of 11 and 0, 1 and 0 in the UFC. He had to take TKO win in August with a doctor stoppage, and he has six knockouts, TKOs out of 11 wins. Uh, Ian, break it down for us. Yeah, I think uh, you know Buckley's a good fighter coming off a great. Uh, KO win, but also to that same tune, people, it's, you got to remember. Also, he got one tapped by Kevin Holland the uh, the fight before it. Um, Kevin Holland's been having doing great since then, but we've seen him have some questionable performances uh, before that. You know, Buckley's got some good experience in the LFA and Bellator, so some of the the higher ranked, uh, kind of lower promotions before the the UFC there. Um, I think it's important to note that Buckley's not going to have the size advantage in this one where, you know, Wright fought at, at light heavyweight in his last fight at 205. Um, you know, he's six foot two to Buckley's 5'10 and has a good four point, or a four inch reach advantage on him. Uh, with that being said, he has an undefeated record, but he got his ass KO'd cold in a, a Dana White contender series fight, which was overturned to a no contest because of some steroid usage. So who knows how much that played a part into it, but it's not like he has the uh, kind of untouchable feeling um so that concerned me a little bit but he had a great debut win over uh ike villanueva with some sick uh taekwondo and and uh tie clinch stuff he looked great in the in the tie clinch um i think he's gonna be a little hesitant because of buckley's last fight but you know he's finished every fight uh that he's been in so far besides the one that he got he got ko'd in uh he's got a 7.79 strikes landed per minute uh average and a at a 77 percent accuracy so with buckley's last win i'm thinking there's going to be some good odds on right unfortunately we can't look at them right now on fanduel for whatever reason they're not looking good um 
but I think if you can get you know, right by TKO at a plus 450 to plus 550 range. I think that's some great value on that. And also looking at the fight to end in TKO at a, uh, you know, if you can get that anywhere uh, better than minus 200 odds, I think that's a great bet for you also. Um, but yeah, not seeing Buckley as the dominant victor as, as a lot of people think. All right, yeah. So I like the fight to end and knock out or TKO. I had a last minute change. I was riding high on Buckley, but then I saw a little bit of Wright's highlights. He is long. He knows how to use that reach, too. And I believe both these guys like to stand and bang, you know, no submissions. So it will stay on the feet, and someone's going to go down. So I like that fight to end and knock out or TKO for sure. Uh, no odds on FanDuel yet, but we'll put it up once the video is there, hopefully. All right, for our featured prelim, we have the number two ranked flyweight Brandon Moreno at minus 200, taking on the number six, the fast and up-and-coming Brandon Royval at plus 160. Moreno has a record of 17-5-1, and 6-2 and two in the UFC. He had a nice unanimous decision win in March. Um, two knockouts, TKOs, with 10 submissions for Moreno. Royval, on the other hand, has a record of 12-4. and four. He's 2-0 and oh in the UFC. He had a Two submission wins in September and May. Three knockouts, TKOs, plus eight submissions. Uh, what do we feel for this one? So you uh, you take a look at Brendan Moreno. You know I think the the areas that he really excels in is the uh, he's got a sick gas tank. He's got some pretty sh sharp hands, sharp striking, and a, a pretty nice jab on him. Uh, like Daniel uh, Rodriguez, even though Rodriguez is sporting the USA flag, still has got that Mexican heart. Uh, and so does Moreno, always coming forward. Um, and he's got good submission defense and wrestling. You can see in the Formiga fight that he did well in the scrambles with Formiga, did, had good wrestling. Um, you know, and Formiga had him in some compromising uh, grappling situations. Moreno did a great job of scrambling out or defending submissions and never seemed to get tired from it. Like you said, he's got a 5-2 and two UFC record and uh, his two losses to Sergio Pettis and uh, Pantoja. And we're a few a few years ago, which are definitely not two two guys to be ashamed of losing to, especially in their primes. Um, I think he's got the heavier hand in the hands in the matchup. You can look at the uh, you know Royville fight against Car France, and when Moreno fought him, Car uh, Royville landed that spinning elbow. But other than that, there weren't too many hard. It didn't look like his hands were really heavy and was doing a ton of damage. He looked touched him up and looked great technically but didn't seem to have the KO power in his hands in, in Roy Vall where I feel like Moreno does you know Moreno's got 10 subs only two TKOs so it's not like he's putting people out with his feet with his hands but I think he does more damage with them with a great submission game you know Roy Vall's whole method of victory so far is just being able to out wrestle and scramble and kind of create that chaotic uh situations and he seems to come out on top with it uh, with his wins over Elliot and Car France, so he's a nasty scrambler with so much energy. But I think um, Moreno just has has more experience, more technique, and is going to be able to make it a calmer um, fight in there. And Royval is not going to be able to out scramble and do all that crazy shit he usually does. So I like to look at uh, I'm looking at Brandon Moreno money line at minus two hundred. Yeah, I like. I actually like the chaos that Royval brings. I feel like he creates so much. He hits you from weird angles. He scrambles in and out, and he just finds a way to win. You know, that's the best part I like about him. Moreno, as you said, loves coming forward and keeping the pressure on. But I think Royval just seems super hungry and super skilled right now in the UFC. I think his confidence is growing from the first two submission wins. And I actually love this fight, number two against number six at flyweight. Next guy should get a shot at the belt. To see who wins on Saturday night, and but I think Roy Ball will just find a way to win, man. He has that thing in him. He he's good at striking. Like he hits you from very awkward angles. Like even though he doesn't carry the most power, and also he just grabs your neck. He likes it. You know he plays around with the submissions as well. So I like Brandon Roy Ball money line plus one sixty underdog. Man, I'll tell you, all these are, are tough ones to call. Looking yeah, just looking are. at this call or this card so far, man. There's not too many ones that stand out as some some easier ones to call, and this one is no no. They're different. all gonna be like fun to watch, and I was thinking know, while we'll going through it, we'll have a great it, time. But then with the picks, it's always tough. Man, doing these these fight research and going back and watching the the film of everyone and stuff, I I was getting excited because I think this is gonna be a sick ass sick ass fight card with Buckley Wright. 
Uh, Dolby yeah. Rodriguez, I think, is going to be a killer, uh, and and more to come. I like Talk having about. a couple debuts on the card too. They always come out hot. They want to prove a point, so I think it's a great card, top to bottom. To kick off the main card, we have number fourteen light heavyweight former champion Mauricio Shogun Hua as the plus one fifty two underdog taking on Paul Craig, who's ranked number fifteen and is the minus one eighty eight favorite. Uh, Hua has a record of 27, 11, and 1, 11, and 9 in the UFC. He just beat Lil Nog in a split decision in July, and he has 21 knockouts and TKOs plus one submission. Craig, on the other hand, has a record of 13, 4, and 1, 5, and 4 in the UFC. He had a submission win in July, and he has one knockout TKO plus 12 submissions in his career. What's the what do we got, Ian? Man, so uh, this one's a little easier to do some some research on because they've already fought before. It's the second time they're fighting. They came to a draw before in their last fight. Um, you know, you said Hua coming off a, a split decision win over Little Nog there. Um, but just looking at the their first fight, you know, Paul Craig's whole thing is submissions. That's how he gets all of his wins is, is coming off of or getting submissions. But only two of them are not off his back. I think he's got a guillotine and like a rear naked choke. All the other ones are arm bar, arm bars or triangles, uh, which is pretty crazy. So really, all he has got to do is you know don't don't engage on the ground, which is funny because you look at the first fight and I, I don't think it was necessarily a draw, but you know uh, Paul Craig came out hot, but then the second and third rounds, Hua spent I think most of the most of the fight in top position on top of Paul Craig, uh, on top of the grappler who. You know, Shogun who is definitely not uh, known as as being the grappler. He's a stand and bang kickboxing guy, um, and he spent the whole fight in the first fight on top. So, and uh, I thought an interesting fact that that jumped off the page when I was looking at the stats are is that uh, Mauricio actually has higher takedown average per fight than Paul Craig does, and it's like Paul Craig's whole thing is he sucks on the feet, but he's great on the ground. Um, but I think that first fight's a weird uh, one off. Where who I wasn't ready for him in the first round thought this guy's only a grappler and got caught uh, on the on the feet more than than he should have. I think he he knows the game plan now, and I don't think there's really any way who uh, doesn't come home with the TKO or decision victory win um, after learning from that last performance. I thought it wasn't really what Paul Craig did. I thought it was what uh, you know Mauricio gave him. And didn't do so. I think he's going to learn from that. And Mauricio Rua by TKO or decision. I completely agree with that. I think Hua did win. Like once he figured out after the first round, getting a little caught, he figured it out. And then I thought he won the rest of the first fight between the two. Uh, Hua also has like a ton of experience. He he's just an animal on the feet. I just hope he doesn't like jump into Craig's guard, which is obviously Paul Craig's best chance of winning and getting a submission from there but as long as he keeps the fight standing which I think he will he'd have learned from the first fight uh who was gonna win plus 150 to underdog I love that pick yeah the fact that he's underdog money I think yeah. you're gonna get a, so much value out of out of who uh, he's a great one to throw into your parlays to throw uh yeah. you know maybe with the Valentina Shevchenko sisters to throw that to some some favorable odds to make a some money on on him also, who has fought? I think six or seven times. He's had rematches, and he's been he's six and one in those. So I don't want to. I don't want to fight Hua in a rematch. All right, I so didn't know that. That's a great uh, Shogun for the win, plus one fifty two. Great stat tonight. Yeah, we got another flyweight fight next. Uh, number ten ranked Cynthia Calvillo minus two sixty favorite taking on number twelve Caitlin Chukagian at plus two hundred five. Clavio has a record of 9-1-1, one, 6-1-1 one, one, one in the UFC. She had a nice unanimous decision win in June over Jessica I. Uh, she has two knockouts, TKOs, and three submissions in her career. Chu Kagan, on the other hand, has a record of 14-4, and 7-4 in the UFC. He had a, a TKO loss to Jessica Andrade recently, and then also unanimous decision win against Antonino Shevchenko early this year. Uh, two knockouts, TKOs, one submission for Callan Chikagian. Uh Ian, who are we thinking for this one? Man, so I always have said uh, Chikagian's the second best point fighter in the UFC. 
uh, behind Shevchenko, where Shevchenko's not only a point fighter, but she's still the point best point fighter in the in the UFC. So I think uh, Chukagian's got some crazy favorable odds in this in this matchup. Uh, I don't think Calvillo's got the ten- or is the tenacious wrestler that she should be or, or, or needs to be. She's got great wrestling, but going back and looking at some of her fights, that's not. I don't think she uh, uses that as well as as she should. Um, Chick Hagen's going to come in with a five inch height advantage, a four inch reach advantage, and um, is is great at, at staying staying the distance. Is one of the most god awful fucking boring fighters in the UFC, but she's good at that style of just keeping the distance and going ha ha. And throwing out little things to to try to rack up some some points on the scorecard, and I don't think Cavillo's you know in the in the category as as Andrade with that that kind of stock. He has the power in her hands um, to kind of pose the same threat to Chukagian and, and close the distance on Chukagian uh, like Andrade did. And I feel like Cavillo's going to need to make it a brawl with a lot of wrestling with to get this win over uh, Chukagian. And I don't think watching her previous fights that she's going to necessarily do that so i think chukagian by points at plus 280 is a great great odds for that um could really much like the who uh win or uh i think could could boost some parlays with some more favorable matchups um i think that's a pretty a pretty confident bet in my book for that odds at plus 280 for caitlin chukagian to win yeah cynthia calvillo has some really good wrestling but I don't think she's fought anyone like Chukagin. Chukagin's fought for the belt and everything before. And I do believe Chukagin learned her lesson against Andraj that she has the height advantage, and now she's definitely going to use it this fight because last time she just got caught with a brutal body shot and then got finished. Uh, yeah, I'm surprised that Chukagin's a plus 205 underdog given that she just fought for the belt two fights ago, and even though she lost her last one in the one before that, she was super dominant, you know, on the feet and on the ground. She was, she just messed up Antonina Shevchenko. Yeah, I like Chu Kagan's height and reach, and I like her to win. But uh, money line, Caitlin Chu Kagan plus two hundred five. Uh, next up, we have a welterweight fight between Mike Perry, minus one fifty four favorite, taking on Tim Means at plus one twenty six. Uh, Perry has a record of fourteen and six, seven and six in the UFC. He had a nice unanimous decision win over Mickey Gall in June and 11 knockouts TKOs for Platinum Mike Perry. Means, on the other hand, has a record of 30, 12, and 1. Very experienced. 14, 9, and 1 in the UFC. He had a unanimous decision win in August as well. 19 knockouts TKOs plus 5 submissions. Um, what are you thinking, Ian? Man, I think I stay the fuck away from this fight. Um... You know, look. You look at Perry. He's known as his brawler and a banger, but his last four wins are are by decision. He's got a couple of TKOs in the UFC, but unfortunately, that was that was a lot of years ago now at this point. Um, but also, Tim Means on the other hand, the, the dirty bird. Uh, I love Tim Means, but um, you know, his, his last fight was Stroopoli. Ate, ate some heavy shots and was still able to to win the rounds after that. It wasn't uh, his chin still there? You know. Uh, you look at his fight with um, Nico Price when he got, gets KO'd, and you think maybe he's he's on the downswing, but I think he proved people wrong in the Stroopoli fight. Um, like I said, he still was able to control the rounds and stuff after, and just keeps everything everything tight. He looks like very uh, like he you know his brain is still working great, but maybe his his body isn't as quick. He looks like he has like an elite martial arts, uh, at least striking mind. Um, so it's just if he can, his athleticism can perform up to that. Um, I don't know if he can coming in at 36 years old with a young crazy ass Mike Perry. Uh, again, I want to stay away from this one because when I look at it and do the research and do the fights research and stuff, I think Tim Means has a has a decent shot of of either clipping Perry or, or getting a decision win here. But in my in my loins tells me Perry's going to win by TKO. Uh, again, I would stay away from this fight. But maybe just a fun little, um, you know, dollar or two bet on uh, Perry by TKO if you're a Perry guy. Um, but again, I'm staying away from this one. Yeah, Perry has that crazy power and that crazy mentality. But Means is a dog. So much experience. It is a tough fight to call. But I think that if Means gets clipped like he did in his last fight by Perry, he would be way more hurt. He's just so strong and so wild. But then again, Perry does not have the best defense. He... I don't know, he walks 
people down with his hands down and everything. I don't love seeing that. But I just think that Perry's the stronger guy, better on the feet, and younger. I like Platinum Mike Perry, money line, minus 154. For the co-main event, we have the flyweight women going at it. Valentina Shevchenko, the undisputed champion, opens up at minus 1,800. Jesus minus Christ. 1,800. Taking on the number three ranked Jennifer Maya at plus 880. So, it's pretty clear I think who's going to win. But let's break it down a little bit. Um, for records, Valentina Shevchenko is 19. 19 and 3, 8 and 2 in the UFC, two losses coming to Amanda Nunes, who's the women's GOAT. Uh, she had a sweet knockout over Kaylin Chukagian in February. I think it was ground and pound. Um, six knockouts, TKOs, plus seven submissions, I believe, for Valentina Shevchenko. Jennifer Mayo, on the other hand, has a record of 18, 6 and 1, 3 and 2 in the UFC. She had a nice armbar submission win over Joanne Calderwood in August, taking her spot as the number one contender to fight for the belt. Four knockouts, TKOs, and five submissions for Jennifer Meyer. Who are we thinking? Man, <laughs> I think there's only one way to think on this one. The decision, I think, on this is what bet you're going to take on Shevchenko. Um, you know, I used to have the three. The three rules where you always bet on Vasily Lomachenko, you always bet on Valentina Shevchenko, and Amanda Nunez, no matter what their odds are, what they're at, they're always lock wins. Of course, Lom Vasily, Vasily Lomachenko douched me the other week on that, so he's out of my list for that, but Valentina Shevchenko still remains on the list. Um, I don't think there's any way you can you can bet against her. The problem with her is she's not like Derek Lewis or some shit where you can narrow down these minus 1,800 odds to say TKO in the first round or by TKO or by submission. Um, she really can get it done in so many ways, even against a Brazilian who's got a lot of submissions under her belt like uh, Jennifer Maya. Um, so unfortunately, I think it's tough to, to narrow that one down um, off of that minus 1,800 mark. Uh, but I like her in, in any parlay possible. She doesn't even do do much for it. But maybe um, uh, Shevchenko by points or TKO or really really anything anything you're feeling on that just to get a little better odds um, to throw her in a parlay. Yeah, hundred percent Shevchenko. She's one. Of, she's definitely one of my favorite fighters on the entire UFC roster. She's an absolute assassin. Maya is really good on the ground, slick submissions and everything, but nothing compared to Valentina. I like Valentina double chance knockout or submission. She's going to get the finish like she mo like does all the time, but I don't know if it's going to be a knockout or a submission. I'd stay away from like the quick ones, maybe round two, but the first round she like takes her time. She works the body, she gets a feel, and then she goes for the kill. So double chance at minus, minus 195 is really good, actually. TKO or sub. Wow, is that add what that line is at that? Yeah, add it to any parlay. I'm telling you that is should be a lock. So after hearing after hearing tonight's I would I would uh, humbly change my my opinion to uh take the points out of there, especially in in this five round one, looking at odds at minus one ninety five for uh for TKO or submission. That sounds beautiful to me. Yeah. Slap that, that in the parlay. Line. I'm so surprised to see that. For the main event, we have the flyweight men going at it. Champion Davison Figueredo, minus 325 favorite, taking on the number fourth, Alex Perez, at plus 250. Figueredo comes in with a record of 19 and 1, 8 and 1 in the UFC. He had a submission in July and then a knockout in February over Joey Benavidez for the title. Um, he's got nine knockouts TKOs with seven submissions Perez on the other hand has a record of 24 and 5 6 and 1 in the UFC he's had a TKO and a sub win as well in June and January of this year five knockouts TKOs plus seven submissions for Alex Perez Ian who's gonna win this weekend man so I was looking at the stats for this one and you know, looking at it on paper without looking at the stats, uh, you think Figueredo's got a big edge in, in a lot of categories. 
Um, but you look at the stats and you got Figueredo landing at a 2.8 strikes per minute average and Perez at a 4.7 uh, strikes per minute average. So almost almost two full strikes landing per minute um, more for Perez, which is a sizable amount when you look at some of the other uh, fighters and what their numbers are for that and how they usually compare in a fight. Uh, then you look at the strikes absorbed. Figueredo's got averages 2.8 strikes absorbed to um, Perez's 3.1, which is pretty comparable. So you, you the stats say Perez puts out more strikes and eats about the same uh, than Figueredo. Then you look at the takedowns, um, and Figueredo lands about 1.5 at a 1.7 average, and Perez lands about 3 even. And that uh, takedown defense, 61 for Figueredo, 87 for Perez. So you would think Figueredo has the advantage striking and grappling uh, just from watching the fights, but the stats t- paint a little different story. Um, with that being said, Figueredo, I feel like, has that that hunger of uh, the contender and the up-and-comers, but he's not. He's a champion. Um, you know, he's buying water buffaloes and, and isn't really living the Hollywood life or getting the recognition that, especially as a flyweight champ, that a lot of the other uh, popular fighters do. So I think he still has that beast, that hunger in him. Um, you can, like, look at the uh, the Benavides fight and uh, he, like, hit Joe with the, the heavy-ass combos, and I think that's... Um, what Perez is going to have some some trouble with in some of his other fights when he fought uh, Figueredo and stuff, uh, or not Figueredo, I'm sorry, um, Formiga uh, ate some some heavy punches, some heavy body shots uh, when the fighters came forward with some big hooks and some flurries. Uh, I think Perez had some trouble. So even with the stats the way they are, I think looking at the the f- fight footage and the fight film and the way Figueredo comes forward and just a beast and is looking for the kill, I think he's going to hurt Perez with some shots whether he finishes it on the ground with some ground and pound or goes for a submission. But I like Figueredo, double chance, TKO, or submission. And I'm looking at that line to come in at a... Give me one minute here. Minus 240, I got you. Minus 240, absolutely right yeah, tonight. I got the same thing. You said t- knockout or submission, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, so Perez got the stats. He hits more better takedowns and this and that. But Figueredo has absolute bombs in his hands dude nobody in flyweight history i think hits like davison figueredo the way he just put joseph benavidez on his ass like five times in one round it's 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 unimaginable at 125 especially um yeah i love perez's heart he, he's coming forward too they both love to come forward so it's going to be a banger for sure do not miss that one but perez has that output because he needs it you know he's he needs the combinations to hurt you but figueredo also has great combinations, but his one two will hurt you more than Perez's one two three four almost. That's how fucking strong he is for right. one twenty five. Figueredo, I think, is still hungry. The way he talks, I think he's just he's like an animal, man. He's just like, yeah, I'm gonna finish you. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do that. And yeah, there was a change in opponent in this fight. Cody Garbrandt, uh, one thirty five fighter, was supposed to fight Figueredo for the belt, but he got hurt. Forgot to mention that earlier. And I think. Yeah, I think Figueredo, man, he's the champ. He deserves to be there, and as long as he as he can make weight, he keeps that belt. Yeah, and and you look at a he's common had some issues. That's why, like, I want to bring that up. Oh, the the weight cut, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, but he's got it now, so at least he can uh, miss weight yeah. and lose his he opportunity to to win the <laughs> win the belt. Uh, and I was just just going back and looking at the record again with their common opponent loss or their common opponent where. Uh, Alex Perez got a loss to Joe Benavidez and Figueredo, I think, dominantly beat him, him. beat him twice. Um, yep. So with that being said, also, you know, you got to lean. And then Perez's last fight was what, Formiga, right? Yep. Yeah, and Perez, uh, TKO Formiga, and Figueredo's only loss ever was a decision to Formiga. So that's fucking MMA math. Yeah, you know? right. That's absolutely like, we right. We try to do all this homework and things, and then we think we have a good answer, but sometimes <laughs> it doesn't work it doesn't out. Like It will up. this weekend. Don't worry. But right. <laughs> sometimes it doesn't work out. It's just that's how the sport works. But yeah, yeah. Perez, um, good. Dana White probably was rooting for him because of the he's coming up from Contender Series, the first – one from that, um, from contender so used to fight for a belt, so watch out for that. But Interesting. Figueredo's not going to let him do that, I don't think. So coming in with this week's 350 challenge, I'm looking at Antonina Shevchenko, Mauricio Hua by TKO or points in the double chance, and Valentina Shevchenko money line to come out to a plus 388 odds. 
Yeah, I like Valentina Chevchenko, double chance KO, TKO, or submission. Daniel Rodriguez, money line, and then Shogun Hua, money line at plus 152, which the total comes up to plus 399 for my plus 350.